Oh, lovely. Okay, that's great. So now, no sugar, Sherlock. Goodness me. They now have to keep printing or we crash. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Welcome to Live from the Vault. My name is Shane Moran and I'll be your host for this episode. And from the entire Live from the Vault team worldwide, we want to thank you for your continued support. And as you can imagine, the community keeps growing thanks to you, the Live from the Vault community. And you know what? There's a lot to talk about here during these historic, and I'm talking about historic times but fear not, because we have the one and only Andrew McGuire in the house, and we'll be talking gold. This is going to be an amazing episode. You're not going to want to miss a word here, so fasten your seatbelts. And, you know, Live from the Vault gives you access to information and updates you just can't get anywhere else. And today is going to be no exception, and you'll see just in a second here. Just before we get to talking gold with Andrew McGuire, you know, we want to continue to keep hearing from you on who you'd love to see as a special guest on the show. So to have your say, simply click on the link in the description below and head over to our Twitter channel and reply to the tweet tagging your dream Live from the Vault special guest. And we'll be keeping a close eye on the results. And with that, let's head over to the UK and Talking Gold with Andrew McGuire. Now, Andrew... It's amazing to be here with you here, but uh, in the recent J.P. Morgan spoofing trial, it, this really is opening up a can of worms, and the industry apologists who have previously denied there was any type of market manipulation, they, they, they said it didn't exist. Now, from what, you are, uh, what you've always been saying here, what, you've, what, what has been revealed, it's attracted the attention from the entire, I think, global commodity traders around the world here. Uh, we know that you provided a lot of evidence for this particular trial. Can you tell us what you're uh, seeing and, and, and what are the results going to be from these disclosures that we're, we're seeing here? Yeah, Shane, that's a great, great place to start because it is the kind of the elephant in the room. And by crikey, does this lead into some interesting areas? So, you know, while this JP Morgan trial focuses, really people are looking at the, they're focusing on the illegal practices and the spoofing manipulation tools employed on an industrial scale to enrich this bank and their clients, of course, at the expense of, of those outside this insider trading loop. The court discovery process has also uncovered a lot of very illuminating inf information that officials wished had not been revealed. Now, even when setting aside the evidence that I provided to the regulators encompassing these exact dates uh, that are being investigated, what the courts have uncovered to the public reaffirms our assessment that JP Morgan acts as a primary agent for the Bank of International Settlements, which is the central bank of central banks. Now, while we always focus on the Bank of International, let's call it the BIS because it's, it's, it's a mouthful. And while we focus on the BIS and its very active gold trading desk activities, and we have done for years, this leads into what the agent banks who are privileged to have gold accounts with the Bank of England are doing for their own book. But it also tells us that the BIS is gearing up for much, much higher gold prices. So before we drill down a little into that, let's revisit what we assessed in our last episode where we looked at the BIS footprints into the July BIS options expiry, which was just a few, really about a week and a half ago. And how concurrently under the radar, they were, they're closing off decades of accrued short bets against gold. Now, this is an official position. Now, just as a refresher, the BIS options expiry is where in the past we've assessed close to a trillion dollars of accrued directly related derivative contracts, which are marked to market, and only some of which are really captured in the Office of the Comptroller report. There's a lot of focus on this OCC report at the moment. And of course, this happens Every time, usually, or usually at the lowest price of the month's trading activity, after which prices are allowed to rise again. Now, every single dollar above or below that month's mark-to-market sweet spot 
is in the past has equated to close to a trillion dollars of exposure. Now, just to explain, the OCC report only tracks the exposure of all insured U.S. commercial banks and the trust companies. So each quarter, and we just had another one, based on information, information filed by the banks of the Office of the Comptroller of these, to, to, to populate this current uh, report, it, just, it does, if you really start to drill down, is it discloses that these insured banks' derivative activities but there is a disclaimer. And, and this disclaimer, and, and I'm just going to read it, says, figures above exclude any contracts not subject to risk-based capital requirements, such as foreign exchange contracts. Hey, what is gold and silver? A foreign exchange contract. Um, with an original maturity of 14 days or less. Oh, okay. If it's less than 14 days, don't bother reporting it. Um, so we're talking about Futures contract, what it is, it's about futures contracts, written options, and basis swaps, basically. Therefore, the total notional amount of derivatives by maturity will not add up to the total derivatives figure in the table. Oh, lovely. Okay, that's great. So now, no sugar, Sherlock. Goodness me. Andy, th this is incredible because I recall that you drew the UK Parliament to, the qu to question the risks that this disclaimer posed to the you know, too big to fail bullion banks and, and, and to respond to unanswered questions that you posed to the Bank of England. Now, you reported this. This is on one of our episodes in Live from the Vault back in, I think it's in July 2019, around there anyway. Can, can you just refresh us on, on, on what's happening here? Yeah, Shane, uh, at our request, Member of Parliament Jeremy Lefroy had the courage or, or having set this question past the Speaker of the House, Lefroy had the, let's just say he had the temerity to question uh, this, to pose a question in the UK Parliament as to why the UK derivative gold exposure of these same insured banks was not being reported anywhere by UK regulators. And having been bailed out by the taxpayers in 2008, the question was essentially, is the Bank of England are they aware of large unreported derivative exposure that may be slipping through the net? Fair question. Lucky we got that in, in there. It was, it, was a, it was a lottery to get it in there. But one of the questions on record was basically, is there a guard against insured banks rehypothecating insured assets similar to what caused the Lehman Brothers failure? Hey, fair question. Now, ultimately, long story short, this led to a meeting with Member of Parliament Lefroy and I, with, Treasure, with, the, uh, with the UK Treasury and the current Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey, who was at the time the head of the FCA. Now, this is when we discovered there was no concurrent UK-based report relating to derivatives as defined by the OCC report. Now, this led to questions about this 14 day, these 14 day forwards and the exposure of these same entities, um, non-US jurisdictions largely based in the UK. And obviously we were looking at this from a UK perspective because that's really what we were trying to attack from, from uh, so we could get some exposure, knowing that the US would not ever, there'd be no chance of getting this read. So this leads us and I'm, and, and I'm making sure this doesn't sort of go on too long. This leads us right into exchange for physicals. Multiple times we've explained what an exchange for physical is. This is when the COMEX futures price, which is technically undeliverable, it's a paper price, can move into the over-the-counter market in the UK and it can be crystallized into physical. Now, the CFTC is the US regulatory body covering these EFPs. However, they state they've got no requirement to track these derivative outflows the moment they leave the US. Oh, great, lovely. And until Basel III was implemented this year, that was, this was a massive black hole. Now, given the trillions of dollars of exchange for physical derivative transactions as reported by the CME on a daily basis, we watch it all the time, um, they lose visibility the moment they flow into the UK as yet, to, at the time, it was yet to be regulated, um, this over-the-counter market, which Andrew Bailey at the, at the time said, unfortunately, there is no regulation for over-the-counter positions. 
So the one concern was that UK bank uh, insured bank derivative uh, exposure was being was completely unreported. So after Treasury had been officially put on notice, um, the plan to regulate the over the counter gold markets in the UK was sped up. And by the time the EFPs blew up in March 2020, so about a year later, this was exactly this is exactly the warning that we presented to Andrew Bailey. And the planned Basel III net stable funding ratios we talk about that were that were, were, were impossible to push back beyond January of 2022 because they knew there was an issue. And, and despite, so this was put into force. And if you remember, despite the LBMA's lobby efforts to delay it uh, late last year. So ever since Basel III NSFRs were introduced at the beginning of this year, we've evidenced a very stealthy unwinding of these interconnected der derivative bets with the object of laying as much of this short load on unsuspecting specs, speculators. We've been seeing that. Now, the trouble for officials is that soon as Basel III NSFRs were introduced in January, sovereign and central banks buying, buying accelerated. Remember, we told you how this had ramped up, taking advantage of this transitory paper to physical period, where for the first time since Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, spot gold contracts had to be backed with deliverable physical, effectively reopening the gold window and solving this unregulated uh, over-the-counter issue. Now, by the 25th of January of this year, <clears throat> the Bank of International Settlements, this mark-to-market sweet spot, was at 1780 that had been exceeded by 75 bucks. So something had to be done in a hurry. Really, you're talking about 75 times the dollars times a dollar times possibly up to a trillion. So something had to be done in a hurry. In other words, billions of dollars of offside derivative bets were simply offside. This time, the over-the-counter longs related to these perpetually rolled forwards came into the crosshairs for physical delivery. Now, right on cue, by no coincidence, by calling in spec-owned, non-deliverable COMEX contracts, in other words, calling in the chips from the house, calling in the chips, ringing the register on these guys, gold was hammered back. Everyone could look at a chart and see gold was hammered back. And it was marked to market. Oh, my goodness. Guess where? 1780. Well, I mean, <laughs> but due to the fact that spot gold was for the first time since 1971, physically deliverable at the COMEX spot price. This mark to market event drove gold. And if you remember, we made a big deal of this in such a deeply actionable backwardation, i.e. the spot market was so, so basically strong, much stronger than the, than the futures market, which made futures market very attractive to buy and move into this Basel III contract, uh, Basel III supported market. We evidence these EFPs alchemize. There's no other word for it. We talked about this massive change in behavior at the time. We were seeing up to $6 intraday backwardations incentivizing the COMEX to be drained. Now, I mean, come on. I mean, as we said at the time, a no brainer, massive risk-free arbitrage opportunity was being presented to everyone. And yes, we've evidenced large EFP outflows before Basel III was implemented, but at 100 to 1 leverage, they were largely paper settled, not as the chart painted COMEX footprints indicated at all. They were being jumped on for physical delivery by central banks, by sovereigns, and a very few clued in wealth managers, driving paper gold prices dangerously close to a major breakout inflection point. So I'm walking you through because we need to know where we've ended up. This loss of control caused a panic. And while specs sell the rally muscle memory had been relied on to cap paper prices, the backwardations outside of the casino, of course, they couldn't hide it anymore. And by the, by the February BIS mark to market events, we see in the January one, we see the February one, gold had risen to 1900. This time the specs had moved into a buy the dip stance and were naked long 
and closing the BIS OPEX sweet spot at $120 offside. Now, obviously, we know that the, that the BIS has been covering, but that was an absolute Rubicon line. Now, worse for officials into this very strong, really central bank driven buying and rising premiums. A few days later, on March the 8th, look at any chart, gold had reached $2,080, $300 higher. Now, do your own math on this. Billions and billions of dollars of undeliverable agent bullion bank exposure was offside. And at best estimate, the Rubicon line for the too big to fail agent banks to capitalize shorts had been completely exceeded. And this is exactly when the CME, this is the casino operator, stepped in. Now, if you remember, we said, hey, look at this. They're reducing margins into a silver price rise. So the silver market is easier to read. Now, they didn't do it in gold, but they did it in silver. It's joined at the hip. That was a sneaky and a very, it was, it was a very, very, very um, manipulative move to really bail out this huge position. So they needed the specs to not just be rinsed of their longs, but to move in short. In other words, take the load. And this is a really good example of when you, write, you reduce borrowing costs into a rising price, which has never been historically seen before, it provided a very good example. And we provided it at the time and we said, this is so, this is unusual, historic, and never been done before. And it told us something was wrong. And so the, what they're doing is the open interest is, is really clearly a control to the house's benefit, but there are limitations. But as we will see, this four month rigged sale program instigated back in March concluded in late July. And by no coincidence, it brought gold right back. Guess where? Yes, the BIS sweet spot again. And it, but it looks like this was the last kick at the can and the new rally point, and really a new rally point. But this time, it's the specs that are wrong footed against short against the house, not like as we moved into into March, they were long, naked long. Now they're naked short against the house and make no mistake. The BIS and their agent banks are now able to allow a higher gold price to emerge. I'm not saying it's a rocket to the moon, but Basel three NSFRs are most certainly slowing the slowly, very slowly draining this COMEX swamp. And a swamp it is. In fact, if we look at where the BIS options position was squared into last month, July, just just some days ago, marked a market event, we can observe how close this came to the prior month's end of June quarter BIS marked a market event, almost to the tick. But here's the point. During this period, we've evidenced the Bank of International Settlements swaps had dramatically reduced. And if you recall, in our last episode, we drew attention to Gatter's consultant, Robert Lamborn, excellent work in tracking these footprints. You know, Andrew, I want to get to, to Basel III. You've, ta you've talked about Basel III here, and also BIS came up a lot. And you know what? We've had so many questions about the BIS and, and for the benefit, you know, the central bank of the central banks is the BIS and how it operates. Can you just spend a, a couple of minutes here looking at, at the BIS? Yeah, we do get a lot of questions on this because they're not a very transparent organization. Uh, in fact, everything they hold is basically held in secret um, and there are no minutes. So this is probably the one single organization in the world where it is unaccountable to any, any government whatsoever. Now, the, what the BIS does is act as a bailey, essentially, for other central banks who earn a yield, have some of their physical gold deposited in the bank of, in the BIS site account for trading purposes. They want to get a bit of a yield on it. However, based on wholesale market footprints, and we've said this many times, up until Basel III NSFRs were implemented in January, it's been our contention that no physical gold has left this site account since 2015. Instead, the paper swap lease liabilities were laid on the balance sheet of primarily the four agent bullion banks who have gold accounts with the Bank of England. Now, Basel III has made this uh, repatriation process a very, very difficult balancing act. And while specs have been tricked 
by the agent bullion banks into taking the load after the last four months. Having reached the limit of what could be laid on these specs, there can only be so much open interest that can be, can be actually borrowed. As prices now rise, the pullbacks will be a lot more shallow, triggering more layers of naked short margin short stops. In other words, they are so borrowed, uh, they've borrowed so, much, uh, uh, so many chips that it's easy to start to rinse them off those and literally cause, cause them to bail on those positions. But conversely, the agent banks must ring the register on them before competing central banks, sovereigns, and of course these very clued in wealth managers remove more physical and steal official short cover before they can ring the register on these guys. And this forces the squaring up of short cover fuel, which it is, therefore making it much more difficult for the BIS to exit the remaining accrued loaned out positions. So however deep into the Basel uh, three unwound process we are, these four market making bullion banks have been able to exit house net short positions and accrue large physical gold and silver positions for their own books. We've talked about this many times, first and second tier banks across the board in uh, buying physical. And while we've evidenced multiple casino orchestrated um, uh, long short spec rinses, in other words, that rinse them up, rinse them down, we're also evidencing now something that's wholly, wholly different. As physical exchanges outside the casino convert COMEX paper gold derived prices, EFP them into Basel III compliant deliverables, namely long foreign exchange compliant long gold uh, short dollar contracts. In other words, deliverable against the dollar. Now, other than the percentage of this EFPs that can be diverted into the non-compliant gold GLD ETF. And that's something we spent a lot of attention on last, last episode. The outflows of the physical gold underpinning the COMEX paper gold contracts is incentivizing market-making bullion banks to take their unfair share of the paper to physical conversion for their own house accounts. Now, while this process unfolds, and under the radar of the COMEX driven algos, which we see active yet again today, these agent banks are assured that any residual leases or swaps the BIS has laid upon their books can be cash settled into a gold revaluation price reset. In other words, the BIS itself is becoming Basel III compliant. However, while the BIS have been busy covering these swaps, stepping up laying these liabilities onto the COMEX specs into this rigged four month price decline, once limits have been reached, a final squaring cash settlement will substantially raise the price of gold. So while derivative gold can be cash settled with a keystroke entry, uh, we think the CME and LBMA alliance will actually allow COMEX gold to rise to protect, obviously you don't want to go into default you will need to protect this cash cow. So they will be allowed to rise. But what it is, what the problem is, is the tricked in naked short specs will lose all their entire margin overnight. We talked about this last time. Now, not just what they've bet, but the liability that they've exposed themselves could lose them their homes, could lose them, put them into bankruptcy. Uh, you can, it's, it's not what you bet. If you go short, and there is nobody to cover into, then the limit, it, it's limitless liability. If there's a gold price reset and you're short on a, on a Friday and by Monday, if the price has risen, you're dead in the water. Now we've lots of first-hand evidence that insiders are already building up a very large physical position and will also be long and strong for an foreign exchange gold into any such black swan event. And it, or in the case of a planned price reset, whichever, look, whichever happens first, they'll be long and strong. This likely means that by the end of the third quarter, looking at the, looking at the outflows from the COMEX, looking at the positioning, the structure, by the end of the third quarter, the Bank of International Settlements would probably benefit from a higher gold price through into the fourth quarter, which actually includes a December expiry. Now, look, you know, we can drill down into the short term stuff, 
but um, but basically, I, I, and I really don't like to drag you know people who are not traders through this. But I think some people have asked these questions, or a lot of people ask this question. You know, very short term. Look, we will see some short term management of these wrong footed herd. They're running from pillar to post. They're easy to to mess with, and as we evidenced in last week's COT report, which holds no surprises. Gold futures rose 72 bucks uh, from 1717 to about 1790. And silver rose a over a buck 60 from 18, uh, five ish to um, 2140 or thereabouts. Now, as we can see, the predatory swap dealers, if you look at that report, these are the predatory swap dealers we refer to all the time. They both rang the register on large size wrong footed spec open interest, the chips, basically, but also move to cap the gold and silver 50-day moving averages. Traders will know what they are. They're very important pivot points. And they did that ahead of an insider known non-farm payrolls beat. And insiders do know what these, these releases are going to be. However, what's missed by the fresh longs the insiders took against the specs after the known beat. I mean, so is that <laughs> the evidence is there, and we'll look at it in a minute. The evidence is there to, to suggest they have an inside track to get this information. In fact, the dips were extremely shallow thereafter and very technical in nature. That's amazing, Andrew. Now, in the last episode that we did uh, just two weeks ago on the 27th of July, you, you noted that the house, uh, as you call it, was about to start ringing that cash register on the speculators who had bet short against uh, the house. You know, since then, we've seen both the gold and silver prices rise, and this process is, I think, is starting now. What do you, what do you see, and where are we heading with, with this? Yeah, Shane, uh, as we indicated, <clears throat> once the house sucks all the chips out, uh, the specs can, that they can afford to even buy and play, they move to ring these re the register before, as we say, others compete to do so. So obviously events like non-farm payrolls last Friday and CPI, which we just evidenced today, we've, what we just evidenced today feeds, we see the algos feeding um, and hunting out straight speculative orders. But how are they able to do that? The house is is so well structured against a lot of layers of very attractive spec short stops, which, as we said last time, uh, should extend all the way back into where they started in March um, or April, really, more like in April, which we said last time really should be around 1900 gold and 25 silver. So this is where their short stops go up to. So wrong footed. Um, in essence, they've been used. They've used short profits to add to these shorts. So the specs, you know, it's not just a question of rinsing them here. They've used that margin. They've used that borrowed those borrowed chips to borrow more chips to the point where we just, as we just said, if there was some sort of black swan event, they would be wiped out. And so they've really added and triple down and double down and triple down. This creates an explosive potential situation with this house at any point ready to pull the trigger. Very confident in, in uh, when you, if you own the house, then you are confident. But Shane, from a longer term perspective, um, that question kind of leads us into more of what the court case against JP Morgan's traders has really uncovered. Because this fresh piece of officially sanctioned manipulation. This is, this is another piece of the manipulation jigsaw. What it does is reveal a suppressed gold and silver price, opening up even more central bank buying. And it, it, the jigsaw is complete enough for global central banks already feeding on a freshly opened gold window to question fair value exchange price for physical gold and silver if it's been manipulated to this degree on a wholesale level. And as we know, there are four market maker clearing members operating inside the privately owned LPMCL, which is the unallocated gold over the counter clearing system, LBMA owned, which of which JP Morgan is the largest. And according to these court records, JP Morgan at the time of these spoofing activities 
were holding more than 40% of the gold clearing book, with the other three, HSBC, ICD, Standard Bank and UBS, really holding the rest of the book. Now, the siloed pr private daily settlement process has provided these privileged banks the ability to mutually settle gold credit and debit positions with no physical attached, as well as to conduct third party transfers. Now, we've looked in detail at this incestuous relationship in the past, and indeed, the latest OCC, Office of the Comp Controller Report, has forced the unwanted Basel III reporting requirements, uh, which exposed JP Morgan and Citibank controlling 90% of all precious metals derivative. Let's just focus on what the discovery process has revealed to the public, the regulators, and very more importantly, competing central banks about primary agent JP Morgan. The, the key thing here is, of course, agent bank. And this is the very same bank that in September 2019 labelled their precious metals trade Desk. This was the DOJ labeled their precious metal desk as a criminal enterprise operating, operating inside the bank for nearly a decade. Well, it was also revealed through the discovery process, though, that while rigging the precious metals markets for their own preferred clients and their own book, always, always to the downside to protect these derivative bets, this criminal enterprise was also acting as an agent for the BIS and the Fed. Now, this is a major, major disclosure. And I think if I just read what Bloomberg said, because it's much better. They sum it up. It's not me. Um, quote Bloomberg. Another set of J.P. Morgan's important clients were central banks, which trade gold for their reserves and are among the biggest players in the bullion market. At least 10 central banks held their metal run by J.P. Morgan in 2010, according to documents disclosed in court. Well, they didn't want that exposed, because that actually asserts what we've been saying. So, I mean, essentially, riding the tailwinds of official gold sa sanctioned gold invention, uh, interventions has from time to night time enabled us to identify and report how these position concentration footprints have so blatantly exceeded intraday position limits for a single entity, making it clear that they were undoubtedly officially sanctioned. Well, that was just empirical evidence. Now we have full evidence. And this level of insider knowledge, including knowing in advance such data as non-farm payroll, CPI data, etc., has enabled these banks to both enrich themselves and their whale clients, which is like Soros, etc., who have skin in the gold shorting game, forward selling options calls, which these banks really have for decades made sure were kept out of the money, often emulating the BIS option structures that we track, hence us focusing on them. Now, furthermore, these court disclosures also reveal the extent of the lock that agent banks such as JP Morgan has historically had on the COMEX to LBMA paper to fiscal imbalance. And while discovery documents from the court also add empirical weight to our assessments of the central bank's role in the gold price containment efforts, we now have blatant confirmation. Now, the insider sanctioned central bank lock on medium and short term price ranges has really enabled JP Morgan and the three other market making clearing banks to profit enormously from intraday price swings rigged in the interest of their trading desks. But it has also depressed real supply and demand prices for physical gold and silver. So, from an intraday perspective, by being afforded siloed smoke and mirrors cover to mutually settle, unallocated gold credit positions amongst these four banks' books, they've been able to cover their intraday footprints. And while from a medium-term perspective, they've been able to sync these activities with their very ag aggressive options market containment efforts, all of which have been mutually agreed, or shall we say officially sanctioned, otherwise they would have been investigated and slammed. And this, as a result, when orchestrated with uh, the controlled supply and demand of COMEX open interest, 
the set ranges that we've experienced have been self-fulfilling. And this is why BIS OPEX, where, as we say, in the historically close to a trillion of over-the-counter derivatives are marked to market on the last trading day of each month, a lot less now, though, because they've covered a lot, it's been such a major focus for us as there are only a few very scant occasions when these preset price limits have been exceeded into this BIS mark to market event, which is also what the insiders are using as their options con uh, containment levels. Now, these discovery disclosures also lift the lid on insider trading infractions conducted by some of the most well-connected Fed insiders and U.S. government officials, such as Nancy Pelosi. It's become, it's become reported. In fact, until very recently, these trading activities have been so brazen that it revealed the, revealed the level of impunity afforded to this insider group taking advantage of rigged, a rigged playing field against the very public that they purport to serve. Now, Fed policymakers have also been caught trading the market on inside information. We are Eric Rosengren, Robert Kaplan. I mean, presidents of the Fed branches in Boston and Dallas. They were forced to resign to avoid, to avoid actually disclosing more details of their, of their trading uh, positions. Uh, on, on, they've been trading individual stocks and financial assets while the Fed was undertaking vast market interventions. This is unbelievable stuff. But more recently, Clarida was uncovered as rotating millions of dollars, millions out of bond funds into stock funds just before the Fed commenced slashing interest rates. I mean, it's beyond comprehension that even Fed Chairman Powell is also an active trader of markets, the markets he influences. Now, if this insider track leads further out, Pelosi is just one example of just how leaky this insider track is. And as the New York Post um, recently commented, um, the Pelosi's are in a position of influence with access to information not available to most Americans. And they have no shame taking millions while Nancy Pelosi leads a party that is dedicated to virtue signaling about the sins of capitalism. <sighs> OK, well, I mean, that's their words. There is undoubtedly an insider loop, though, even if there's no direct evidence of insider trading, because they know how to cover their, their footprints. However, a lunch meeting, a friendly call, or at the very least, the executing broker knows exactly where these bets are placed. And Greg Smith's footprints in the trial revealed during this court case, uh, it was just focused on, while well, they were just focusing on the spoofing tool being used as the trigger points to rig prices, but what it does expose is how known insider information, quite obviously sourced from the Fed, insiders determining policy, was being shared with the likes of Soros and other whale customers. Well, we are absolutely living in historical times here. And another reason why you just can't afford to miss another episode or any episode of Live from the Vault here, uh, Andrew. Now, you, you, did, you already brought up Basel III, but before we were, uh, re started recording here, uh, you mentioned something that Basel III is changing the game. You, you were talking about, about that. Can you maybe uh, talk to our viewers about what you were commenting on there before the call? Yes, absolutely, Shane. And this is where we should take heart. Step back from the deliberately rigged chart chatter. I mean, look at it, CPI today. I mean, it's a joke. I mean, it's algos chasing, chasing uh, the specs around. But this is indeed where Basel III is changing the game. And the clue is how the BIS is moving to exit its lease and swap positions. I have much more direct evidence on this as soon as I'm allowed but it leads me to, it, to at least estimate and assess what likely by the end of the third quarter, the BIS will benefit from a higher gold price through to the fourth quarter, which I say, as I just said, includes December BIS options expiry. December is, is the one month a year where silver and gold um, futures expi expiries happen at the same time. And it is the largest quote unquote delivery month of the year single and that is usually where 
the whole year's options positions are reset. This is an interesting situation. So very short term, I'm recording this on, or we're recording this on Wednesday, the 10th of August. Uh, the option structures following this dubious non-farm perils number. You only have to dig under the, 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 the headline number to see, hang on, this isn't as, as bullish as it seemed. And of course, we had CPI data just a little while ago. Once they had a chance to fully settle, and they haven't had a chance to fully settle yet, but the specs who sold calls at 1800 look increasingly vulnerable, and the immediate BIS sweet spot is around 1820, but we actually anticipate this to be forced to rise this month. Now, in and of course, this reflects where the positioning is of the, the banks and their whale customers. Now, I think this is going to rise. In silver futures, the spec calls sold at 20 are looking extremely fragile. Uh, then each time you've sold a, basically, if you sold a, a call, in other words, you're saying, Anything above 20, I lose money. Um, and because I don't, I'm going to, I don't think it'll go above 20. Huge mistake. Um, because what they're saying is, as soon as it goes above that, they're forced to delta hedge, which means to buy futures to offset their losses. And they have to do it on every breach. And these bets extend all the way up to 25 bucks. So once again, algo driven, well, as soon as this algo driven CPI settles, we likely see insiders continuing to pull the trigger. Now we're watching this closely as silver is coiled for a very large COT driven short covering move. In other words, officially driven short covering move. The house is ready to move. Now this, there's little doubt in my mind that the office, um, uh, the official gold price su uh, suppression game has now been exposed by the court discovery process. And with physical exchanges now becoming more liquid every single day, the only question to pose to everyone is how much physical gold and silver do you own? All right. Thank you, Andrew McGuire, Talking Gold. And remember to our entire Life in the Vault community, buy physical and understand the difference between what Andy affectionately calls the casino paper, gold and silver markets, and the actual physical gold and silver markets they're not the same uh, don't be fooled and there you have it that's all we have for you today on another fascinating i think historical episode of live from the vault and please help us spread the word about this channel by hitting that like button sharing it with all your friends and family and subscribing and if you want to click on the bell you'll be notified as each episode goes live and we want to hear from you our live from the vault community we want to continue to hear from you on who you would love to see on a, as a special guest on the show and to have your say simply click on the link in the description right below here and head over to our twitter and reply with uh, by tweeting or tagging your dream live from the vault guest and we'll be keeping a close eye on with that and with that we'll see you next time on live from the vault we'll see you then